Welcome to Ask the Expert, featuring leading neurologist and muscle physiologist, Dr. Stephen Cannon, answering some of the most often asked questions from our website and social media channels. Remember, the content in this video is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician with any questions regarding a specific medical condition. What does it mean when my genetic testing comes back with VUS to many mutations? Are the variants of unknown significance important when they are found in locations where the periodic paralysis patient's genes are located? VUS stands for variants of unknown significance. So a variant means your DNA is not like the template of the standard individual. And you should realize that all of us have thousands, over 20,000 variants in each individual. So the significance of this is really hard to sort through. We know certain variations are very rare and show up repeatedly in association with disease, with periodic paralysis. And so uh, there are about 20 or 30 that are well recognized uh, in the sodium channel and the calcium channel genes that can cause periodic paralysis. But there are many others where it's a rare change. So to be a variant, it needs to be uncommon because the common changes, we see them all the time. We see them in normal people, they're fine. So what if you get one of these things out of left field that you see in only one in 10,000 people? How do you make sense of that genetically? That's the rare variant that's difficult to figure out. And there are a lot of uh, hard science behind this, algorithms that people in bioinformatics use. We look at it as people who you know, study how ion channels work. So we're making slow progress, but it's always going to be the Achilles heel of the genetic testing. What happens when I get this rare variant come back? The other issue is the way these tests are devised is the screening of genes is clustered. So when your doctor sends off a blood test for genetic testing for periodic paralysis, the company actually tests for many, many genes, all related to different muscle diseases. Because sometimes the symptoms overlap, and so the physician's first hunch might actually be off. And so for efficiency, why not test a bunch of genes? So not only is there the challenge of variants that come back on genes that we know can cause periodic paralysis, but the report may also have variants in other genes that have nothing to do with periodic paralysis. So it's alarming as a patient to receive this report with this long list as, oh my goodness, what's going on here? And while that might have some medical relevance, it is irrelevant to periodic paralysis. So seeing these variants in unrelated genes, don't view that as a risk factor for periodic paralysis. It's, it's extraneous information. There are a handful of well-established genes that cause periodic paralysis. So hypokalemic periodic paralysis is the most commonly occurring one that people are concerned about. This is caused by mutation in a gene that goes by the name CACNA1S, which is calcium channel type A1S. That's one of the genes. The other is a sodium channel gene, SCN4A. I know these numbers and letters are a mouthful, but you need to recognize that, for example, uh, there are 10 sodium channel genes in all of us. And some of those genes are turned on in the heart and they regulate your heart rate. Others are turned on in, in nerve or in the brain and they're responsible for other functions. There's one special type, the type 4A, that's in skeletal muscle. And so if you had other sodium channel mutations, that might be interesting if you have arrhythmia or epilepsy or something, but that's irrelevant to periodic paralysis. So it's important to recognize that you need to ask the question, okay, it's a variant in a sodium channel, but which sodium channel? Is it the SCN4A? Or which calcium channel? Is it the CACNA1S? Those are the big ones. The other form of periodic paralysis is the Anderson to Will syndrome that has uh, a risk for uh, arrhythmias of the heart as well as certain characteristic features where the face, fingers, stature is uh, shaped differently. That's a potassium channel, that's a, a KCNJ2, a different one. So there are three big ones for periodic paralysis. Places like uh, the Periodic Paralysis Association, they have a lot of background information on uh, genetics. There are great websites that are sponsored by the federal government, uh, Organization of Rare Diseases. Um, 
you know, th there's a lot of misinformation out there as well. So you need to be a little bit careful. Go a little bit beyond, a little deeper than Wikipedia. Um, um, most, you know, anything sponsored by the National Institutes of Health or has a .gov after it, you can be pretty confident that's been peer-reviewed, scrutinized, it's going to be accurate. An older but popular question from Facebook. Explain if someone can have spontaneous mutation of periodic paralysis, how can this happen? Thank you. One of the key features of periodic paralysis is that it's inherited and in a dominant pattern. So you would expect half of the members of the family on average to be affected. So what does it mean when suddenly a child looks like this is a case of periodic paralysis, but neither parent has the disease? So some physicians who um, aren't tuned in as well might think, well, this is impossible. You can't have periodic paralysis. Neither of your parents has periodic paralysis. But it's been very well documented this can happen as a new spontaneous mutation in the formation of either egg or sperm. So somebody can pass on the trait even if he or she doesn't have it themselves. And that's where these spontaneous cases come from. There seems to be a lot of individuals who experience periodic paralysis in combination with other diseases. What's your thoughts on this matter? You know, life is complicated and um, nobody has the classical uh, textbook symptoms of periodic paralysis. There's always something else that goes alongside of it. And in fact, that's one of the things I enjoy the most about attending the PPA meetings, which I've done now for 20 years. So for example, I learned that the attacks of weakness are associated with significant muscle aching pain, which is not in any of the textbooks initially. And the neurologists were concerned about physicians confusing cramps, which is a different condition, and episodes of periodic paralysis. And so they were you know, probably biased not to emphasize the pain. There's another feature. You mentioned multiple diseases. So many people with periodic paralysis have loose joints, hypermobility. Uh, there's a genetic syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And many individuals with periodic paralysis, they meet the clinical criteria. So the curious thing is these are completely different genetic disorders. So the Ehlers-Danlos is complicated. There are many different genes, most often related to connective tissue. So things that affect collagen and other things that how your tendons are, tendons are put together. Whereas periodic paralysis, it's excitability of skeletal muscle. So it's ion channel genes. So these are unrelated. They're not close to each other in the chromosomes on the genome. So why they are happening as lightning strikes twice uh, is a complete mystery. These components that make up tendons that are responsible for flexibility or, or the, how strong your skin is, these same molecules control where these channels are in the surface of the cell, on the membrane. So they're important for targeting the channel to put it in the right place. So maybe you have a problem with the same protein that makes strong tendons is also the scaffolding that tells the channels where to go in the muscle cell. You know, they might have what looks like a channel disease, but their channels are fine. They're just in the wrong place in the muscle cell because of one of these. So these are all interesting possibilities, but it's to be determined. If you would like to know more about periodic paralysis, visit periodicparalysis.org. And if you enjoyed this video and want more, hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and hit that bell so you don't miss any future videos. It really does help spread the word. You can view other videos about periodic paralysis by clicking the thumbnails to the right. If you have questions, just leave a comment below or reach out to us on social media. We'd love to hear from you.